afternoon and happy Arbor Day. Welcome to today's webinar, Wildlands and Woodlands, a vision for sustaining forested and natural landscapes, presented by the MBL's Falmouth Forum and the 300 Committee Land Trust of Falmouth. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar will be live streamed by our friends at Falmouth Community TV on public channel 13 and also streamed on their website, fctv.org. This webinar will be recorded and rebroadcast on CAI's The Point, May 6th. We will also post the recording on the Falmouth Forum and 300 committee websites. As a reminder, the audience will be muted and cameras turned off. Please feel free to ask questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We will do our best to answer each and every one. And now, a few words from Anne-Marie Runfolo, board president of the 300 Committee, followed by a very special video of Shallow Pond. Good afternoon. I'm Anne-Marie Runfola, president of the 300 Committee Land Trust of Falmouth. For 36 years, our private nonprofit land trust has worked with the town, community groups, and other conservation organizations to permanently protect more than 2,500 acres of open space and prime farmland through acquisition, education, and stewardship. Our community reaps the benefits of land protection in so many ways. Together, we are safeguarding our water and other natural resources, increasing our resilience in a changing climate, providing public green spaces, connecting people with nature, and fostering and celebrating Falmouth's unique character and culture. Our membership includes nearly 2,000 individuals, families, and businesses who share our belief that public conservation land makes Falmouth a healthier and more beautiful place for all of us. The federal government 30 by 30 plan and the town's open space plan both call for preservation of at least 30% of our land as open space. We're not there yet in Falmouth, but we have come a long way. And if we continue to develop a community conservation ethic and work together, we will make it happen. I'm sure the discussion you're about to hear will remind us why our collective work is so important and inspire us to keep moving forward. Big thanks to the University of Chicago Marine Biological Laboratory and our 300 committee team for organizing the lecture and creating the accompanying video, especially Nancy Bridges, Day Mount, Tom Stone, Lucy Helfrich, Jessica Rittenauer, David Foster, Zoe Cardone, Mindy Todd, and Allison Leshen. Thank you all. Well, it's fabulous to be here. This is really quite a striking place. Uh, the forest is beautiful. The bird sounds are great. The landscape is diverse. Today, you know, the earth is really in a crisis and we all have to do everything we can to avert it. And that means we need to act globally to alter the shifts that are occurring in the climate. But that work ultimately needs to start right here, right where we live, right in our backyard, um, working with local organizations to protect land and to allow the earth to really work well for us and for nature. Uh, the 300 Committee Land Trust was formed in 1985 with a goal of preserving land in all villages and all areas of Falmouth. We've preserved 23% of Falmouth's land area, over 2,500 acres of land. Uh, the property that we're at today, the Shallow Pond Woodlands, was preserved in 2017. Permanent conservation of this 70 acres would create a 183-acre area because of the connections with Brivogel Ponds Conservation Area and the Wald Fender Conservation Area. The beautiful thing about this forest and so much of the forest mm -hmm. and woodlands 
across New England is that they're relatively young and the trees are growing rapidly, taking in carbon dioxide, converting that into wood and material that gets into the soil as organic material, and so really make the earth a major site for the storage of carbon, taking it out of the atmosphere and holding it from accumulating in the atmosphere where it can change the climate. So when I walk into this gorgeous landscape, what I see on a day like this is and it is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and it is storing it as carbon in the trees and it's also going down below ground. And I think that often we don't think about that. We're used to walking around up here and we see these gorgeous towering trunks of trees around us. But if you think about it, really that much stuff all of that tree trunk, you could be turning that upside down, putting it down below ground. There's that much root material down below ground. These second growth forests will continue to grow like this for a century, two centuries perhaps, maybe even longer. And the trees will just get larger and larger and the ecosystem will continue to work to reduce the rate of climate change. The fabulous thing about the work here in the town of Falmouth by the 300 committee and other organizations is that you've got a big goal, which is to conserve at least 30% of the town. That's a scale that's really important for what we're talking about. If every community would just pitch in and think about what can be done to improve the lives of people who live there, but also generate benefits for the rest of the world, we'd all be in a much better place. These landscape pieces that are connected are just so inspiring for someone like me who thinks about how landscapes work and how we keep them working, both to keep them going, keep nature moving along, and to sustain human beings. Good afternoon. I'm Ambassador Day Mount, welcoming you on behalf of the Marine Biological Laboratory and the 300 Committee Land Trust. An Arbor Day welcome. On Arbor Day, worldwide, people celebrate the benefits of trees. The tradition is to plant the tree, but today we want to plant a vision, a vision of wildlands and woodlands and how they benefit us. This celebration is happening through the support of three nonprofit organizations that rely on our contributions, Marine Biological Laboratory, WCAI, Cape Cod and the Islands Public Radio, and the 300 Committee Land Trust. Please consider financially supporting these organizations through their websites. And for the MBL, please designate the Falmouth Forum Endowment so that we can do more of these programs. Wildlands and Woodlands, a vision for sustaining forested and natural landscapes. The principal visionary today is Harvard professor David R. Foster. David is a professor who has just completed 30 years as director of the 4,000 acre Harvard Forest. He's a practitioner as well as a teacher with an amazing CV. In the midst of a bunch of learned articles and special programs, I picked out several themes. David teaches Harvard's longest running freshman se seminar course on ecology and many current practitioners credit this course for choosing to work in the field due to both David's academic ability and his monitoring, mentoring, I'm sorry. From a climate perspective, David established the Harvard Forest as a LTER, a long-term ecological resource site for studying climate and global change. Here, the MBL has been a major partner and we see David's ability to bring other scientists together to work to achieve really big goals. In 2005, David published the Wildlands and Woodlands Vision for New England and Beyond, 
inspiring multiple other organizations to join together for a common purpose. In short, David Foster is a scientist who teaches, mentors, and reaches out to others and has inspired them with a vision for a healthier future. Joined as you saw by Zoe G. Cardon. Zoe is a senior scientist in MBL's Eco Ecosystem Center. She also has an amazing background for research and publication. Zoe has developed a scientific understanding of forest trees and plants, as we heard, both for what's above the ground and what's beneath the ground. And as we really need to focus on climate change, we need to know about both the carbon that's stored in trees above the ground and in their roots and in the soils below the ground. Furthermore, we need to understand the factors that are key to establishing and maintaining healthy forests for carbon storage, for fresh water, for recreation, for many purposes. So Zoe's perspectives shed valuable light on our vision for sustaining forested and natural landscapes. And finally, we're hosted by Mindy Todd. Mindy is the host and producer of WCAI's The Point. With 30 years of radio and television experience, she has won five national public radio awards for best call-in program and best interview. To our delight during COVID, she has hosted Falmouth Forum speakers on The Point. For those of us in her Cape and Islands audience, she is our media star, trusted and acclaimed. Now, let's hear about wildlands and woodlands. Sorry, but I was unmuted. Um, thank you. Uh, I think sometimes when you walk through some of these conservation lands, you think, oh, isn't this such a beautiful green space, right? But um, we don't, don't often think about the importance of why this, this space needs to be, served, be preserved. So I wondered if we could sort of start with some thoughts on the importance of conservation. And, and David, um, maybe you should kick us off with this. Sure, happy to. Well, I think if we just step back and think broadly, um, the earth provides all the resources that we need to live. And it is a self-sustaining system that has supported humans for a very long period of time. So the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink all comes from the earth. And so we need to develop an ability to live on earth in a way that we allow it to sustain us. And that means moderating our use of resources and keeping as much of the earth intact as we possibly can. And for that portion that we use to derive our food and our wood products and live in, we need to moderate our activity such that we impact nature as little as possible. So conservation really sits at the core of sustaining all life. So do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I would add, when I think about it, it's yes, living on earth and, and in fact, it's living with earth. We do rely on, services, if you want to call it that, that the earth provides, that ecosystems provide. And I think that we often just kind of expect them to happen. For example, we expect pollinators to show up. We expect to have some, some flood control. We expect water that comes out of our, out of sewage treatment systems to be treated by microbes as it makes its way down to, to our estuaries. We, we have expectations and, and our footprint now is large enough on the planet and locally that we can't have those expectations anymore. We have to be active participants with nature to make sure that these systems continue. The two of you walked through that shallow pond conservation area. I wasn't able to be with you that day, but I, I walked through it yesterday myself. And it's such an important piece of property, like so many, right? Um, there's such diversity there in the vegetation, in the vernal pools. Um, but I think what struck me in particular were those tall trees, right? And um, it, it can almost feel like you're not on Cape Cod. 
And and David, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. We don't. We, I'm not sure we see that that much here on the Cape, but perhaps more throughout New England, right? Yeah. Well, what what we see here on the Cape is something that's happening all across New England, which is that uh, in most places where we leave the vegetation alone, where we do conserve the land and don't actively manage it and harvest it intensively, our trees are actually getting bigger. And certainly what we're seeing here on the Cape and what we see in the surrounding islands and other landscape is that the forests are recovering from a long history of relatively intensive use and actually deforestation. And so all the time we're experiencing forests that we've never seen before. And that in many cases, people have not seen for 100 years or more. And so it is surprising uh, when you walk around to recognize how, how forested the landscape is and how tall the individual trees are. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the forests of New England are relatively young. So give us kind of a summation of what is happening here in the Northeast and, and why the forest is so important. Yeah, the, the forests are young because they are recovering from deforestation and intensive use. Um, the fact that they're growing rapidly, that individual trees are growing rapidly, the whole landscape is functioning more and more as a maturing forested landscape means that we can drive all kinds of benefits from those forests. The most important benefit that we're focused on right now has to do with climate change because the individual trees, all the plants, and many other organisms are taking up carbon dioxide and storing it in wood and then below ground in the soil and in roots. And that serves to reduce the rate at which carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere. So it slows the rate of climate change. But there's so much else that those forests provide us in addition to their beauty and the habitat for many organisms and the cleansing role that they play with both the air and with water. So um, we were just talk, talking about what's happening above ground. And as, as David mentioned, there's a lot going on below ground as well. And I think, I don't think we think about that a lot, right? We're walking through, we look at these, we say, yeah, great, these trees are great. They're, you know, they're absorbing the carbon dioxide. But talk a little bit about what's happening below the ground. And the, the other thing when we, when we let these forests sort of be, you have dead trees, we're not, we're not picking them up and taking them away, right? These are kind of little ecosystems in themselves. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, yeah. There's a tremendous hubbub <laughs> below ground, a hum. If we could hear it, it would be almost deafening. And well, what is that? Well, under there is are the microbes, for example, the fungi and the bacteria that are decomposing all the dead stuff, <laughs> recycling it, making the nutrients that are in dead leaves, for example, or in the dying trees that you mentioned making that available again for new life to grow. And that kind of recycling, that natural recycling that happens, a lot of it down below ground, is what has sustained the planet far longer than humans have been around. And we can take advantage of that natural capacity to maintain the fertility of landscapes if we just let them be. There are, I don't know if, if people are aware, but for example, the in agricultural landscapes, about, about half of the agricultural lands in the world now are degraded. And one of the major ways that we can improve them is by taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it as organic matter back down below ground, storing it there again, great for climate. But also that improves the ability of the microbes to do their job, to get this recycling system going again and retain water. So all of this is integrated. The, the climate crisis is integrated also with the biodiversity crisis and really a crisis for humanity and how we're going to maintain ourselves in a reasonable way on this planet. Mm. So water quality is huge, of course, for, for everyone, but 
uh, when you have a sole source aquifer as we do here in the Cape, um, what is happening above and below, it's, it's critical, right? Talk a little bit about, about this sort of special place here and why this is important to us. Yeah, that's really important to us. So um, on Cape Cod, there are several lenses of, of water. They're essentially just a pile of fresh water that is sitting on top of a bedrock or um, is floating on top of some salt water. And that is our water source. It comes from rain, it comes from snow, it has infiltrated down through these soils that are so critical for us. And it slowly makes its way from a lens, this pile, ours is ours for filament is up by Stagmore, and slowly goes through the ground, through groundwater, all the way out to the edges of the ocean, into our estuaries. And along the way, of course, it's picking up pollutants if we're putting them in. It also is passing by all these microbes that are down there that can process some pollutants and can take care of some toxic, toxic components if they have the chance. So I think that it's really important on Cape Cod to be thinking about where, those, where the water is flowing. It's really important to be conserving areas that we know feed directly into where our water, our drinking water comes from. And the shallow ponds area is a beautiful example of that. It's right smack dab in the middle of the state designated recharge zone for drinking water from Mayor's Pond. And Falmouth gets water from Mayor's Pond. It's also really important because of that interconnectedness with, with the surrounding areas. And it's really important because it, it, it exemplifies stakeholder collaboration to preserve areas rather than having them be developed and add more problems in the groundwater that really have become horribly apparent <laughs> since the 1970s here on the Cape. David, you wanna add some thoughts on, on water quality and, and land preservation? Well, I think the whole aspect of, of water shows why it's important to think of the landscape is a completely integrated set of ecosystems. The, as Zoe just said, our estuaries are strongly dependent on water that is flowing from inland to the coast. And in that process, the water interacts with forests, it interacts with farmland, it interacts with wetlands, and of course, it interacts with various types of water bodies and streams that bring it into the estuaries. And so if we're going to have productive marine life, if we're gonna be able to live off of the ocean, we need to take care of our estuaries. If we're gonna take care of our estuaries, we need to have clean streams. And if we're going to have clean streams, we need to take care of our forests and manage our farms and our forests in ways that it doesn't degrade the water and so that they work to support nature and to support us. Sandy has a question, she says, in regards to the sole source aquifer, she says, has all the extra hand washing of late had a noticeable effect on the water table? Anybody well, know that's answer? really, that's a very interesting question <laughs> to which I do not have an answer, but yeah. that's, that's a very interesting Good question. Point. On the water table, I would kind of doubt, but I, I wonder whether we have used as a town a whole lot more water. Yeah, that, well, that's knowable and would be very interesting. <laughs> I want to mention if you do have a question, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to um, type your, your questions in there. Oh, Jessica, uh, Jessica has the answer to that question. Um, Jessica Rittenauer from 300 Committee is going to answer that question for us live now. Go ahead, Jessica. Oh. Jessica, can we, we can't hear you. I don't know. It's, are we having trouble getting Jessica on? We'll, we'll, we'll wait till we can get Jessica. While we're waiting for yeah. Jessica, I, I can just make one comment, which is an important point to realize is that much of this coastal landscape, I happen to be sitting on Martha's Vineyard right now, but the islands and much of the Cape actually have a, an abundance of water. We have plenty of water and using up our water is not the issue. It's despoiling our water. It's ruining the water source. And because this landscape is 
so porous of sand and gravel, it's very easy for point pollutants to actually affect a very large area of water and contaminate the water supply for many, many people. Yeah, and that, that, sorry. Go ahead. That has implications both for our drinking water, obviously, which we care about greatly, and for our local um, economy too, which I, I think we all realize that we should say out loud, I mean, we not only do we really depend on, on influx of visitors that are, that are going to be hitting us soon here on the Cape and, and we need our, they, they are coming for the beauty, the local beauty. They don't want to swim and I wouldn't either in a algae laden pond. And if we have to make sure that we're not putting so much nitrogen into our coastal systems and into our ponds that we get toxic blooms or, or just green algal blooms that are then choking out the fish and hurting our fisheries. And there's a whole cascade of effects. Um, Victoria is asking, how can forests be sustainably harvested? Which trees should be protected and which harvested? Well, I think that's exactly the crux of what we're talking about, which is that the first thing we need to do is to keep as much of nature intact as possible, and then to manage those areas that we keep intact in a way such that they continue to sustain natural processes, natural biodiversity, and human life. And as Zoe pointed out at the beginning, we've had the luxury of being able to essentially mine the resources on Earth with very little regard. And until really the industrial age and the recent past, we've been able to do that without really thinking of the future. But as environmental problems increase, and especially as we start forcing the entire Earth system to shift in terms of climate change, we're recognizing that that kind of callous and unmindful approach is going to lead us into doom. And so we do need to manage in a much more considerate fashion. So what that means is actually overall, we need to think much more about the resources that we use. We use many more resources than we need to live individually and as a society. And then the way that we extract those resources on the earth needs to be done much more carefully. So in terms of the specifics of that question, I would say it's not so much which species we should manage, but it's how we approach that management. And one of the things that we have actually emphasized very strongly within both the wildlands and woodlands report that we've made, the studies and reports that we've produced, and within the companion New England Food Vision, which talks about producing our as much of our food needs as possible from the New England region, we think it's very important to try to obtain as many resources as we can right from where we live. And there's a, a lot of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that the New England landscape and nature within New England is remarkably resilient. And we can manage it in ways that it can sustain people and still sustain a lot of natural process and the vast majority of biodiversity. And that's not true of all parts of the world. And there are intact parts of the world that would be threatened if we do not produce our own food and our own timber resources and other resources from our own backyard. You mentioned that New England Food Initiative, but before we get to that, I wanna talk about farmlands just to kind of put it all in perspective first. Um, here in Southeastern Massachusetts, 
we used to have a lot of farms, right? And a lot of those bigger farms have have gone by way of development. But it seems in um, at least the recent decade, maybe longer, we're seeing a lot of smaller farms kind of pop up. There's sort of been this move to, you know, local and growing your own whatever food that might be. I just wonder if you can sort of give us an idea of what's happening on that farmland front. Yeah, so it is useful to have that historical perspective. Um, you know, in about the mid 19th century was the peak of agriculture in New England, at least in terms of cleared land. Um, agricultural production continued through the rest of the 19th century and remained very high into the early part of the 20th century. And then the number of farms decreased as they had been since the mid 19th century. And as agricultural land was abandoned, the landscape naturally came back to forest. But agriculture in New England shifted from that 19th century really diversified landscape in which most of New Englanders were being supported by food that was grown here to become much more concentrated on crops and products that weren't easily shipped or that couldn't be maintained over long distances. And so New England became very dependent and very focused on dairy agriculture. What you're seeing today is actually an, a new shift back to a more diversified approach to agriculture. So yes, there are a lot of smaller farms, um, but there, you're seeing crops grown more that have not been grown for a long time. You're seeing some new crops, and you're also seeing a movement of raising animals to produce meat from the landscape itself, mm. which is really going back to a kind of 19th century diversified approach. Of course, there are new new techniques and, as I said, some additional crops. But this focus these days about on trying to derive more and more food from the local environment and having more and more communities involved in supporting agriculture in their townships and within the kind of land within easy reach is leading us to think much more about the way that we farm on the land to do it in a way that's not both diversified, more organic in general, and taking better care of the land with an eye towards some of the factors that so brought up. So tell us what this New England Feeding New England initiative is, or is it Northeast Feeding Northeast initiative? Tell us what that is. Yeah, so that's part of this effort, which is to increase the availability of healthy local food for all communities. And so the intent there is to build up New England agriculture in this diversified fashion with an eye towards supporting a healthy diet for the majority of people in the region. And it's related to this New England food vision, which basically looked out into the future and said over a 50 year period, how much agricultural production could we develop that would be sustainable? And what could that comprise in terms of a healthy diet for New Englanders? Mm -hmm. And the estimate was that if we expanded agricultural area back to what it was in about 1950, that it'd be possible to support about 50% or provide about 50% of the food that New England needs right here from within New England. And so New England Feeding New England is trying to promote that effort. And it's coming out of each of the New England states. And the current goal is to look out to 2030 and try to produce up to 25 to 30% of New Englanders food right here. An, an, an anonymous attendee question, what is the impact of the contamination around joint, the Joint Army Base? So maybe you have some insight oh. into that? <laughs> well, it, it's interesting that the 
plumes are quite well mapped and there are remediation systems in place, many of them. Um, I think that, you know, our water, our municipal water supplies are very well tested. Um, I still say running mine through a Brader filter and, and drinking the water. I think there are others probably in the audience who can speak to this more with, with more um, experience. I've only been here for about 10 years, um, but we know where contaminants are. They certainly are still there because of this water flow that we discussed earlier. They are, they can move around the landscape. Um, but I think that from the point of view of worrying about our water supplies, for example, our municipal water supplies, and uh, generally overall in the, the whole, in Cape Cod as a whole, um, we, can, we can keep, keep the problem somewhat contained. There may be some others who can write in more about this. Mm -hmm. I have a, a couple of questions about the, the base and the proposed machine gun range. Given the importance of the Upper Cape Water Supply Reserve in providing drinking water for middle and upper Cape towns, how will the multi-purpose machine gun range at Camp Edwards affect this recharge area and threaten the conservation of state enlisted species? It's a very good question. It needs to be answered, I think. And I don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, Janus, Janus, oh, no, can I just talk? say? Yeah, go ahead. No, just to say that um, I think that as we recognize how important our intact landscape, our intact natural landscape is, we as a society need to get to a point where we question every attempt to clear additional forest land or to occupy existing farmland with development and structures of whatever nature. And so while that particular activity may be objectionable to people from a whole variety of different perspectives, um, every time we clear a forest, there are consequences and there are consequences in terms of the global environment mm -hmm. and so we need to become much more cautious and apply much more scrutiny to the whole range of our activities yeah I, may i quick, yeah, quickly go ahead. Yes, yes go ahead yeah i think that what we're we're dancing around but not saying explicitly is that Nature really is providing solutions to the climate crisis, really, and the biodiversity crisis together. And, and these natural climate solutions, this is something that, that people are talking about a lot, experts are talking about a lot. And it's thought that maybe between 25, 30% of what we need to do, literally globally, to get to where we need to be with the Paris Agreement and not having more warming than 1.5 degrees C, which is already a lot, but at least not go over that. Maybe we can get 30% of the way there just with these natural solutions. And these natural nature-based solutions include things like reforestation, but also simple things like don't cut down another forest. A lot of, the, a lot of these, the nature-based solutions are fairly tractable and they can be done with relatively little technology and we don't need to build necessarily a gigantic plant or a huge array to reflect sunlight or whatever. We have to definitely decrease our fossil fuel use, but we, we have to stop putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere. But the systems that we rely on in nature already are helping us and they already could maybe get us up a third of the way there. So by protection and restoration and good management, we, we, if we embrace those, we could be in better shape. So you're just making me think of just in this last year where everybody's been kind of hunkering down and staying home and the, the differences we've just seen Yes. I mean, look at the, the, the videos from the canals in Venice and you know, the clear the way. I mean, really we've seen I think improvement that has really surprised everybody, right? Yeah, so I think that, that 
it's easy to become jaded and worried and pessimistic and um, perhaps even for some hopeless. And I don't think that we should be hopeless. I think that we should be optimistic. I think that we need to, to harness this, this moment where we are realizing our dependence on nature. We are seeing fires, we are seeing droughts, we are seeing changed hurricane seasons. <laughs> We're experiencing a whole lot of things that we wish we weren't. And um, I think that, you know, with nature as the ally, living with Earth um, and taking advantage of, of things like the plan, the 30 by, by 30 resolutions to save nature that are, that are now gathering momentum to try to save 30%, protect 30% of land and 30% of ocean in the U.S., we're already doing that. I mean, aren't we ahead in Falmouth? Isn't that great? The yeah. committee and the town are already doing that, right? So, so, so but that's the goal. 30% of ocean, 30% of land in the U.S. to try to safeguard ourselves, to make sure that we do have these, these climate important and biodiversity important, ecosystem service important um, activities still going on in, in the natural world. So, you know, it's very interesting that that's going to require more than just a, a, you know, a bunch of federal land somewhere else. It's, it's going to require partnerships with, with, with um, tribal groups. It's going to require um, conservation, rural conservation and understanding that local stakeholders have to be involved in the conversation. They have to be part of designing the solution for the kinds of reasons that David's talking about. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to feed ourselves. We want to be able to take care of our communities. And it's, it's interesting to me what he brought up about um, you know, forest management coupled with, with food here in New England. I, I think of forest management is in Maine, um, large privately owned tracks, for example, and somehow within this regional network that he can envision, We've got to have the cooperation among states. We have to have the cooperation in the, among regions. We have to have operations at the local level that will make it possible for all these interconnected systems to be maintained. David, do you, do you want to add anything to that? Just that the, your optimism about this 30%, you know, we have this 30-30 plan and you know, we talk about Falmouth being 23% there, but when you look at you know, bigger areas, are you optimistic that as a country we can do that by 30-30? I mean, by 2030. Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm very optimistic that, that we can do that. Um, I'm very optimistic that we can do that if we want to do that. And we, we need to have that as a goal. And we need to understand that that is a goal to get us to 2030 on our way to 2050 and 2060. And so, you know, the goal that we've actually identified that we think is really quite reachable for all of New England is to actually conserve intact 70% of the New England landscape and forest. And that would vary by state and vary by region. You know, a state like Massachusetts and a state like Connecticut should be able to conserve upwards of 50% of the landscape and forest. And then the remaining area would be partially developed and then existing farmland would be kept intact such that you could provide food from that. So yes, I'm optimistic that we can do it. Um, I'm optimistic that we can actually get to that much larger goal down the line. I know that we have to do it if we are going to address the issues that are facing us. I mean, the most recent analysis in the state of Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts issued in 2020, the 2050 decarbonization roadmap for the state. And to Zoe's point, with everything that we deal with in terms of technology and shifting to electrification of cars, and our houses and, and everything else, even if all, is that, all of that can be provided through renew, renewable energy, the land itself, the forests, play an absolutely critical role. And so that 2050 roadmap says we have to 
minimize the amount of forest land that we conserve, and that even at the best that Massachusetts can do, it still can't do everything it needs to do to reach net zero. It needs to reach across the border to other states and to other parts of the country that are less populated, that are more heavily forested, and work with them in a coordinated regional fashion so that we're coming up with solutions that deal with a much larger piece of earth and that bring us all in towards balance. Gina says, what role does keeping really young forests, like one to 20 years old, and shrubland as part of the forest matrix to help support the species that depend on it, like the New England cottontail rabbit, especially in a landscape that has evolved with disturbances like fire, hurricanes, et cetera. And how would this impact the carbon, carbon sequestration versus storage ratio? Yeah, so this, this is a really critical and fascinating issue. Our goals in terms of biodiversity and our focus on what we want the landscape to look like are very strongly dependent on our own personal histories and on the recent history of the landscape. And so if you go back to the 1500s, and this is one of the things that we do an awful lot of research on, you know, the landscape of New England, which supported perhaps in excess of 100,000 people who had lived here for eight to 10,000 years, more or less, that landscape was almost completely forested. And there was, there was certainly a thriving human population, but it was a human population that was not living off of intensive agriculture and was basically living off of the resources that nature was providing. And those resources, of course, in the waters and along the shores and in, in marshes and so on were just tremendous. Over the next 500 years, you know, starting with the arrival of European settlers, we cleared the landscape and farmed it very intensively and used a lot of the forest to support um, industry and basically to provide housing and to keep warm. In the process of doing that, we transformed the landscape into what it now is, having now recovered over 100 to 150 years from the most intensive period of agriculture. And so we have a landscape that has a real diversity of open lands. We have grasslands, we have shrublands, we have heathlands, we have young forests, we have we have maturing forests, we have almost no old growth forests. And that would have been the predominant condition in the 1500s. And so the biodiversity that our landscape supports today is probably quite different in terms of the overall abundance of different species, their distribution, and their relative importance. And so there is a real question as to what we want to maintain. But if we want to maintain current biodiversity, we do need to keep grasslands. We do need, do need to use young forests. But we have the ability through the kind of agriculture that I was talking about earlier and through careful forest management to provide those habitats while also providing resources that we need for human society and sort of balance off the needs of nature and the need, needs of humans. Mm. David said, what, what constitutes a forest? What constitutes a forest? There are a lot of different definitions of forest, but you know, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that a forest, piece of forested land remains a forest until you actually uproot and remove the native vegetation or replace it with something else. And so what that means is that if you have a forest, and it gets blown down by a hurricane, or the trees get damaged and killed by a fire, it is still a forest. And even though it may not seem to many people like this, it still is a thriving forest. Those natural processes are something that nature has dealt with forever. If you come in and cut a forest, 
it still is a forest. So you're not deforesting by cutting some of the trees. You're not deforesting by, expo by having the forest be blown down by a hurricane. And so it's really important to recognize that forests will recover from those kinds of events. And if we just give them the time and allow them to stay intact and to recover by themselves. So, um, so David had said he was optimistic uh, that we can, we can do this if we want to. And it makes me kind of think of, of the importance of climate change. And certainly there are a lot of adults who feel it's important and there are some who don't. But when we look at the younger generation, it's top of mind for them. And I just want to make sure but we don't run out of time to talk about this, about training this next generation, which I know the MBL and, and you are a part of. So talk a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree 100%. The energy and the dedication <laughs> of young people is going to be critical for taking the necessary steps into the future. And you're right. We, for example, at MBL have a a semester in environmental science that's dedicated, it's like a dedicated boot camp to training students from all around the nation. About 24 of them are coming this fall to uh, understand how to think about ecosystem function and the eco these ecosystem services that we're so dependent on and how to maintain them. Um, also, there are research experiences for undergraduates that happen both at, at Harvard Forest um, where David was head, as well as at the MBL and a number of other places, wildlands around the around the country. So I think that through these kinds of of um, training experiences at, for those students who are already at the the college level and really know they are very concerned about the environment, fantastic opportunities. But then also there are things like the 300 committees establishing tea ticket park. That was absolutely brilliant. It's in an area of town that is pretty built up and they turned what was, I, I believe, a driving range into this park with a, a wetland area, walkways, and connected it to teaching an elementary school and have a little outdoor classroom out there. And I think that that is so important. We need students to be out there in nature understanding and experiencing it and, and coming to see their, that they are part of it. And I think even during the pandemic, it became more obvious. We all needed to be outside on these conserved lands, walking around seeing trees and breathing fresh air and hearing the birds and realizing that life does go on. Yeah. Try to get to a couple of my questions. Uh, Sarah writes, I've heard a lot about forests in the West becoming carbon sources to the atmosphere due to burning. Is there a stage at which New England forests could reach a similar point due to fire or slower growth? Yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question. Um, out West where um, there has been really a tremendous loss of forests or loss of many trees from the combination of insect outbreaks and fires. Um, the types of fires that occur out there and coupled with uh, insect defoliation and mortality can certainly turn landscapes into carbon sources until the forest starts to recover. Um, New England is very fortunate in the fact that actually prehistorically and, and kind of historically when the landscape has been heavily forested, um, it actually doesn't suffer very much from forest fires. And so that kind of, and the fires that we have are not the types of fires that are going to kill um, vast areas of trees. So that's not going to happen. Most of the impact to New England landscapes that generate um, a shift in carbon uptake and could shift the forest to a source of carbon have to do with direct human activity. And so we have vast areas in the northern part of New England, which are very intensively managed, harvested very thoroughly and have been for 100 years or more. And many of those areas are barely accumulating carbon. And when they're 
actually harvested intensively, they do become carbon sources. And so it's direct human activity that shifts the balance predominantly in, in New England. And the ability of our forests to recover from the natural disturbances that we have like hurricanes is such that um, those impacts are pretty muted at a regional scale. Uh, Carl writes, uh, are we at present seeing documented forest vegetation species and structural composition shifts in Southern New England as a result of climate change? We're, we are seeing shifts in the behavior of species. We're seeing shifts in a variety of wildlife. We're not seeing structural shifts and compositional shifts in our forests. And there, one needs to study very intensively over a long period of time to see that and to document that. And there is some evidence, for example, coming out of um, studies in some of the uh, New England mountains of, you know, modest shifts in some of the distribution of species, but nothing, um, nothing that would be obvious and nothing that would be very significant as of yet. I mean, the basic fact is that the majority of our trees live a relatively long time. And the kinds of climate shifts that we're seeing are not gonna kill the trees. Um, and so as the climate changes, our trees are not gonna be replaced and are not gonna change very rapidly at all. But we'll change them the most rapidly and set them up to shift quickly is direct human activity. So cutting down trees and especially clearing forests and really opening them up to a variety of new activities and new species. Got a number of questions here about what you can do sort of on a personal level. And, and Laura has a question that says, conservation of existing woodlands and other natural landscapes will not achieve all of the goals. How do we encourage private landowners, particularly homeowners with smaller land areas to adopt practices that encourage increased biodiversity, carbon sequestration and other ecosystem services like pollination? Laura's kind of summed up a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> Well, let me take a quick stab and then Zoe can follow. Uh, there's, there's so much we all can do as individual homeowners or individual residents. You know, we can, we can reduce the areas that we manage intensively. We can, you know, so that we're using less fossil fuels. So we're letting nature actually dominate more of our landscapes. We can do that in a way that we encourage native species and discourage non-native species. We can, we can look at our landscapes that we live in and talk to our neighbors and try to manage in ways that our small areas actually contribute to something that's much more significant. And so we can try to play off of the landscape setting that we're in to support nature much more than we do. So? Yeah, I think this this maybe goes full circle back to why I still have optimism <laughs> about reaching 30 by 30 or half by 50. Um, and that's that um, when we're thinking about private land conservation, that is a critical component of, it, of achieving these goals. Yes, we have national parks and state parks and wildlife corridors and refuges and et cetera, et cetera. Um, urban conservation and private land conservation is going to be absolutely critical. And I think that maybe this is where my, my background coming from, from Utah, Northern Utah comes in. You know, I, I knew a lot of people in agriculture, a lot of people who are ranchers there, and they care about their land. They care about whether their livelihood is sustainable. They care about whether the, the areas are degraded on the whole. And so I, I do think that um, once we really embrace the notion that we are part of nature and dependent on nature and that all these functions that we provide in different ways in different places are interconnected and need to be balanced and that we, we really cannot keep driving many ecosystems down and degrading them. The more we embrace that and realize it, and I think we are, 
I think the more individuals will be part of the solution. Individuals, small groups, communities, local groups, then up to state and federal and global. Thank you so much, uh, Zoe Carden and David Foster. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for the work that you both do. We really appreciate you taking time. I'm sorry for those questions we did not get to, but thank you all uh, who attended today on this important conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. And that concludes our program. Thanks for being here. <laughs>